end up talking too much, uh, my voice will disappear. Oh, my gosh. Well, guys, good morning. <clears throat> you guys get up in front of anybody and speak? Well, you know something? I absolutely hate it, too. I hate it so bad that I make videos. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's the craziest thing because I used to be just like that, and still to this day I get all worked up and everything. But sometimes you just have to accept the, that it's going to happen. You see uh, my bag over there. It's got a little sticker on it. It says, embrace the suck. It does. And people ask me about it all the time, and they're like, why do you have something that says embrace the suck? It's because... Throughout your career, there's things that you're going to have to do or you're going to be obligated to do, and it's the suck. You don't want to do it. Matter of fact, I'd rather quit my job than do it, but we're all in this together, right? Like, there, there's a certain hierarchy to any career field, especially a technical one, when as you go up, you're going to be more responsible for other people. You're going to be responsible for um, teaching people and whatnot. It's, it's part of your responsibility as a technical person. And speaking is going to be one of those things. I've had to give speeches to medical people, doctors, um, half the clinical staff of a hospital before. I've given speeches to about safety, electrical safety, stuff like that. Um, you never know what you're going to walk into. So embrace the suck, guys. And this is one of those moments because I would love to just stay at home and play video games and whatnot. But obviously, my life has taken me in different directions, which is why I brought this with me. This is not what you think it is. I'm not here to sell you guys nothing. This is my company that I'm vice president of. Guys, I'm vice president of Phoebe Medical. Dead serious. When people tell you throughout your career, you can't do this unless you do that, you need to do this or else this won't happen, don't listen to any of them. Don't listen to any of them. I am a high school graduate. I have technical school through the military. I have been to several OEM schools, but I have two things that they weren't counting on. I have motivation and I have a hustle, okay? Your hustle is what you're good at. It's something that you wanna do. It's something that you think you can do better than other people, and your motivation is how bad do you want it? I mean, that's your drive. And I work till nine, 10 o'clock at night, sometimes later, all the time. When I go to these trade shows, I'll be up till 2 o'clock in the morning editing video footage, making sure that stuff looks correct. I've done 12 and a half hour long videos where you have to do your studying, you have to write a script, outline, record, edit, all that for one seven minute long video clip. It's the suck. But at the same time, guys, it's, it's my hustle. It's, it's what I love doing. I love teaching people. And unfortunately, that means i got to get out in front of people, too. <laughs> so the reason I'm bringing this is because Phoebe is a multi-million dollar company, and they called me up and they wanted me to be vice president of business development for them because I do something and I market myself in a way that most people don't. So guys, don't ever listen to somebody when they tell you what you can and can't do or what you will or will not be. When I go back to Michigan, I'll tell you right now, that's where I grew up. Uh, I had people a few years ago that were coming up to me and they were like, hey, are, are you in, were you in jail or something? What's been going on with you? It's was like, are you serious? I was a sergeant in the military at the time, and I was at my uh, best friend's wedding. His mother came up to me, and so did the uh, mother of one of my other friends. And they said, like, what, whatever happened to you? And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Like, <laughs> so uh, you never know where you're going to go in this career field, and it is absolutely everything that you make of it. I know people that got straight out of college and they started their own medical companies. They're probably, if they're not millionaires right now, they're close to it, really close to it. Do you think they work 40 hour weeks? I, I promise since the day they started, they haven't worked 40 hours. And I haven't worked 40 hours in, in as long as I can remember, like going back years. Because when I got out of the military, it was miserable. I thought I had a grasp on everything. I was nine and a half years into this career field. I thought I had a grasp on what we do, and I was so wrong. I had some older guys, because in the military, it's all younger guys. I got out in the civilian world, and I realized they were all older guys. A lot of them didn't want to share information with me, and the ones that did were awesome. They were phenomenal. Some of them are not even alive anymore, unfortunately. But 
That's why this cycle is so important for us to continue. I'm continuing it. He's continuing it. It's the cycle that you're going to be expected to continue. Even if you become a clinical engineer and you become on the management side of things, you're still going to be expected to help the career field and bring people up. So that's why I brought this, uh, is to show you guys that it doesn't matter what people tell you. You are what you are. And just remember that. And with that being said, I would like to do some scenarios with you guys. Now these are real scenarios, things I have actually seen. And it's, if you knew some of the stuff that, that has happened. I have had doctors taping down surgical tables because the brakes quit working. Tape. I don't know what tape y'all use. Tape isn't worth a damn, okay? You never know what scenario you're gonna walk into. And that's why I figured it was gonna be really important to uh, go ahead and do this with you guys because these are things that I actually have seen. And I kind of ranked them from like level one up to like mastery, like stuff that you'll be expected right from the beginning to like when you know you're, you're on your game, okay? And it's gonna take a couple years to get there. But just to show you the scenario, uh, what could happen. So anyway, I did some homework and I printed up the scenarios. And I am gonna need some help on these because, uh, because these are not as simple as you think. Okay. And then at the end of the scenario, I will go ahead and ask you guys questions because that is how I know if you guys absorbed everything correctly. Okay, so for this scenario, is this going on? Uh, I need a doctor, a nurse, a biomed, and an ESU. Well, I think I found my ESU, it's over there. Um, so the doctor, professor, because he's probably one person that can relate to the situation. Uh, oh, 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 it doesn't really matter if it's an ESU. This guy will work. This guy will work. Okay, I'll tell you what. I don't mind if I do. <clears throat> so he has no clue what I'm going to put him forth. And, you know... It doesn't have to be in the issue. It can be a defib. When it's a life support device like this and there's an incident, we treat things differently. I mean, a life support device is, when something goes wrong, it's a big, big event. You might as well kiss the next two uh, days of your life goodbye because you're going to have to do incident reports and emails and all sorts of stuff. So anyway, Doc, come on up. I'm going to have you take a look at this. <clears throat> so the scenario is actually really short. It's really simple. And you can see right there, Okay. All right. So we need to send this to Biomed. This thing is broken. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Or more so, let's see. When this happens, there's always a lot of people in the room. Okay? So you guys, even though you're in your seats, you're all participating because this is exactly how it is when I walk into an OR. There are upwards of a dozen, sometimes two dozen people in the room, and they're all looking at you when you come in. All right? So... As this, uh, as this one works, okay. <laughs> so this one here is uh, walk in with little to no information. Let's see, should I get a cable? Choose one cable, one cable. So if you follow what I'm about to tell you, you will be so much more successful than most of the biomeds out there because they all make this mistake. All right, guys? So go ahead and start out uh, with scenario one. Okay, send for biomed. This equipment is broken. As soon as you go in, before you touch anything, guys, the first thing I always do Put on my gloves because while it might be a equipment failure, you might be touching the patient. It's true. Hmm. 
Okay. okay. I definitely see a couple problems. Okay. It's just not working right. Hey, Doc, uh, would you mind showing me what it's doing? Well, all I know is broken. Okay. Well, I show me, can you please show me, like, what you think is broken on it so that I can maybe make a better assumption? See, it's not even coming on. There it is. Ah. Okay. Well, that was a, uh, interesting problem. When somebody left the defib, they left it in monitor mode instead of putting it in off, and you actually just seen the error code right there. That's right. So, what we can do is this unit is obviously not plugged in. It's got an AC mains detection on the front, which it will light up. Make sure that they're always in the off mode when they walk away. It was actually in a power safe mode, and that's why when you walked up to it, it just didn't do anything. But if you turn it off, it does. So there you go, Doc. Anything else you need? No, yeah, I think we're good. I appreciate it. Thank okay, you. sir. You can give me a call at any time. I'll be happy to come back, okay? Okay. All right, sir. And scenario. There is so much stuff that happened right there that people mess up on. And that is exactly how it should happen every time you walk into an OR room. So, first question. What was the first thing I did when I walked in the room? First thing when you walk into any patient room, any environment where they're treating patients, put gloves on. Absolutely. That's the number one thing. And so many people mess that up. What was the first question I asked to the doc? You asked him what's going on. Absolutely. And then what did I do? You asked him to show you. That is the key thing. That is the number one thing that biomeds mess up. When you walk into a room, everybody's watching you, right? When you ask the doctor to do something, you can stand back. Guess where everybody's watching? The doctor. They're watching the doctor, not you. When everybody's watching you, when you walk into an environment and you don't know what's going on, you first off, you don't know what mode it was on, you have no clue. But when you ask them to try it out for you and demonstrate, they're watching that. So the pressure's off you. You can actually be a spectator. You take a step back and you watch it and you just see what it's doing. It gives you a buffer of time to make up your mind on what's going on. And if you can't come up with a solution, what do you guys think you do? If you have a replacement, you can offer a replacement while you take that is away. the one thing. And if anything, we'll get to that later, but uh, if anything, if there's any doubt whatsoever, change out the equipment, you know. But luckily this one here, I didn't induce that by the way. I was not expecting that. And that was a very interesting error because if you leave it here and you walk away, it will go into a power save mode and it looks like it's off, but it is not. And it's on monitor mode. So when he walked up to it and he flipped it to defib, the first thing he did, well, you didn't flip it off first. When you flip the defib from off to any other range setting, whether it's pacer or monitor or defib mode, it goes into a self check. Because when you flip it from mode to mode, it doesn't do a self check. It knows that they designed it properly. That was not expected. Nonetheless, that is a real thing that could happen. And honestly, uh, I'm kind of surprised I haven't seen that because defibs unplug happen all the time. And they normally just beep periodically every couple minutes. That defib has been in my car for the last day and a half. So <laughs> <laughs> it probably gave up beeping. So uh, what was the final communication with the customer? Uh, telling him that if he needs anything else to contact you and that you're available. Absolutely. That the customer and technician relationship is a really close one. So the last communication that you want is to make sure that they can reach out to you even if they don't feel safe with that device. And that's the most important thing is, yeah, it might have been a simple fix. Maybe it has another problem. We don't know. The doctor doesn't think technically. All he knows is that, hey, maybe I don't trust this device. So if he gives you a call back and says, I don't like the color of it, go and do something. Don't just tell them, hey, you know, that's just the color they are. And what's the last thing I did before exiting the room? Take your gloves off and sanitize. Absolutely. Oh, that is so important, guys. Okay, so this one here, this one burned me, and we'll talk about that after, after the scenario, okay? You don't have any anesthesia machines in your lab, do you? Oh, my 
God, I, I, was supposed I, get, I was supposed to get one donated and I ended up trading it in. Man, I, I had one from Memorial and Herman and I didn't know what to do with it. I should have called you up. Because it was, uh, so there's a water leak in the room and the water, you know, with it, with any life support device, if there's water involved, it's dead. It doesn't matter if it works absolutely fine. Water gets underneath chips, it gets around batteries, it gets like in places that you don't want on a life support device because it makes it one day stop doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? And it's so unpredictable. Oh, jeez. All right. My phone blows up all the time, guys. I apologize. Anyway, this scenario here is one that I, I got burned on, and I'll tell you exactly what happened on that because I'm, I'm still sore about this to this day, and that's why I preach it, okay? All right, Doc, come on back. Uh, this one here, <clears throat> this one is personal. <laughs> um, yeah, this one's personal. This one's called Doctor Doesn't Trust the Equipment. And it's good that we can do a, a defib on this because in real life this happened with an anesthesia machine. Perfect timing. We found our next doctor. Excellent. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe one of those. Um, okay, you are my assistant on this because when I go out in the field, I often have a Biomed one with me for this exact reason, okay? All right, let's do this. All right, Biomed one, you're gonna, you're gonna come with me. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Should I do it the correct way or the incorrect way? I'm gonna do it the correct way. Okay, the correct way first because the incorrect ways will burn me. Okay, guys, let's do it. Go ahead, just run the scenario. Okay, send for Biomed. This equipment is broken. All right, let's do this. Oop. Oh, they can play on me too. Yeah, they're not going to fit. All right, anymore. it's okay. It's the muscle memory that matters. Hey, Doc, what's going on? I heard that you have a problem with your device. Well, it was working, and then all of a sudden it just stopped working. I, I don't know what's wrong with it. Oh, okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Well, it looks like it's not charging. Okay. I'll tell you what, Doc. We're going to have to change out your device, okay? Well, am I going to get another one? Well, um, you know something? I think you can get another one, but... Uh, hmm. What do you think? Well, I'll tell you what. All you have to do is switch it to monitor, back off, back up the defib, and it should start working just fine, okay? So all you gotta do is reboot it. I, I don't know if I trust it. I, okay. I've, I've been burned on this thing, and I, I just I just want it out of here. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. I will go ahead and I will start arranging the cabling on this guy and getting it straightened out, because these guys are always tangled up with other devices. Hey man, I need you to run, find me an exact unit just like this, bring it on back here. I need all the accessories. We're gonna change out everything. I need the foot controls. I need the consumables. If you can find consumables, check the expiration date on them and bring me another one ASAP, okay? Yeah. All right, man. Take your gloves off before you leave the door too, man. <clears throat> okay. Well, let's see. All right, sir, where are the consumable pads that one with this device? Oh, I think we threw them away. Okay. Um, I'll tell you what, if there's any other cabling that goes with this, just let me know when we bring the new unit in. Go ahead and bring me the new unit in. Is it not an actual one? No. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. All right, man. Here, take this one while I set this one up for the dock, okay? You got it. All right, man. And we're going to set the foot control over for you. I'm going to plug it in over here, red outlet. Okay, dock. Here, I'm going to show you that uh, this one here is working. It's powered on. It's going to go through the self-check. Okay. Looks like it's working good. Is there anything else you need from me? Yeah, once I got a good working one, I'm okay. good. Okay. Excellent, Doc. I'll tell you what. Uh, I'm going to leave my telephone number with the circulator. You can give her a call. If you need anything, I'll rush right over. Okay? Okay. All right, Doc. Thanks, man. Thanks. Okay. It seems simple, doesn't it? It burned me so bad that I had a doctor screaming at me. Oh, I'm not playing. screaming. <laughs> doctor, doctor was screaming at me. So what really happened? Uh, you know something? 
Yeah, go ahead and bring it up. Bring it up. Bring it up. So in real life, what happened was I had an anesthesia machine. And on an anesthesia machine, there is a manual mode and an automatic mode switch on every single one. If you notice, there's a bag on the side of the anesthesia machine. Uh, and then there's the bellows, which uh, drive the air down into the patient. Well, there's a mode selector. So you go from manual mode, so the doctor has a tactile response to the patient's breathing circuit, and he can control how and when the patient wakes up. But you guys didn't know this. How do you think patients wake up from anesthesia? They have to be given a medication. That's what we all think. It's crazy. None of the above is true, right? So what happens when you hold your breath? Let's say you are the best breath holder in the world. What happens when you hold your breath? Uh, oxygen levels reduce in your blood. I don't know how specific. What, what do you think happens? Yeah, they do. But what eventually is going to happen? There's contractions and you eventually are forced to breathe. Yes. Yes. When carbon dioxide builds up inside the body, there's a natural response that you can't control where your body jump starts. It's like electrical jump start at that. And your body just naturally wakes up. So no matter how deep the anesthesia is, they literally stop the air. I'm dead serious. And, and this is the type of stuff that I learned as a bioman that completely blew my mind. I've been in heart transplants. I've been in, you know, brain surgery. You name it. When I found out that that's how they woke them up, it just tripped me out. Because when you're done with a case, they shut the machine off. It quits driving the bellows, the air, into the patient and it goes into manual bag mode. The doctor is watching the SpO2, which is oxygen saturation. He's watching the pulse rate. He's making sure because your pulse should go up as your body's trying to compensate for the decreased oxygen level. If something doesn't happen, they can go into action, but he has control. He has the bag. The machine stops doing what it's doing. Well, what I had a problem with is on that flip switch. You flip it and it kept driving the air into the patient. So when a, when a procedure is done, like the, it's, it's very organized, like minute by minute, what should happen? And if not, there's an emergency procedure backing it up. Every single thing is, is, is organized. If it doesn't happen, well, they can induce again with like propofol, they can go into emergency response, open heart surgery. I've seen all the above when things go wrong. But the thing is, when you flip that switch, that machine needs to stop breathing so that they can start its stopwatch, and they can start watching to see how long the patient's gonna wake up. Well, what happened to me is my Biomed 3 went into the room and he flipped the switch back and forth really violently and the machine every time recognized on the screen that it was in a different mode. It wasn't doing what the doctor said. Well, the doc told him he still doesn't feel safe and the, the Biomed assured him, no, it's working fine now. Well, that's when I got involved because the very next case was a child. They were doing eye surgery on the child. They were going to wake a child up. And if you guys didn't know, on children, there is a less of a buffer that you have time to react. So with a, with a child, they'll crash like instantly. They don't have the concentration of blood, the amount of oxygen in the blood. They don't have the luxuries that a full-size adult has. A child will die like really quickly. So they're very fussy on things like when they start breathing. Anyway, me and a Biomed 3, uh, this other Biomed 3 responded, and this poor guy, um, actually he was a Biomed 1 at the time, he was an electrician that became a Biomed. Well, he walked into the room, the doctor was screaming at him that this happened. And in hindsight, if any doctor ever says that they don't trust a piece of medical equipment, it needs to get changed out. I don't care if they don't like the way the print is coming out, if the cable's in the wrong color. I don't care if there's a sticker on it and they don't like the stickers. If the doctor thinks that the device is possibly defective, he's focused on the device for every little minutia instead of focusing on his patient. I don't care if you have to take it down the hall, stick it in storage, and bring another unit out and change it out, and then later on put that back in circulation. I've proved devices are defective you know, that they're perfectly fine before. But when the doctor thinks that something's wrong, it doesn't matter if he's right or wrong. As long as his focus is on the medical equipment, you're wrong, 
okay? So scenario two, I've been burned on that. One of the most embarrassing things in my career is when this, when this anesthesia doc was screaming at us because his machine was still defective. It's all because I had a biomed who was a challenge. We'll call him a challenge. Some biomeds out there shouldn't be biomeds, man. So anyway, this one here, oh, this one happened to me directly too. Okay, so I did a video about this one and uh, this is probably one of the most intimidating things I've had to go through in my career. And I've had doctors yelling at me and stuff like that. And if I make it sound like this is negative, like everything's negative, not everything's negative, but you have to expect that doctors have somebody's life in their hands, all right? If you had somebody's life in your hands and you're, in, let's say you work for 30, 40 years and it all is on the line based on your next patient, like his career could be done if this goes wrong. I would be more uptight than most doctors. Yeah, you know, I've had stuff catching on fire in the middle of a room and, and the doctor is like, oh, hey, man, I think there's a problem over here. Now, I've had other doctors that are throwing scalpels across the room, like, get the shit out of my room. I've, I've had everything you can think of, and I don't blame them because their entire livelihood and the patient's life is in jeopardy, and it's their responsibility. It's not your responsibility. You're just the cleanup crew, okay? So, hey, let's go ahead and do this one. I'm going to need a biomed assistant again for this one because this, uh, this is a good one. There's cable going here. All right. Okay. Excellent. Let's do this. All right. Um, are you going to be the doctor? Uh, you want to be a doctor? I need a biomed one too, because uh, the next two scenarios. She'll be the doctor and I'm going to be the okay. one. Okay. Excellent. So this one here, <clears throat> do you guys know what a line isolation monitor is? Okay. Sounds very technical. It probably kind of is. So imagine an alarm panel on the wall and you guys have something very similar to this in your house. You guys see that little electrical outlet that's got the button that says test and reset, and you know, and you plug in a hair dryer and it pops. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, hospitals have that too. And unlike the thing that's in your house, the ones in the hospital can't shut the power off. Because if they shut the power off, you don't know what's plugged into it. Like literally somebody could die. Okay. So instead of having an auto disconnect, like in the GFCI, they alarm. It alarms at the wall, like either dee 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 or eh. Like I've, I've seen 50 years worth of limb panels. You will encounter them. So I did a whole video on it. You can check it out. It shows you what it does, but it's, it's a very cool technology. It's been around for half a century, but when it alarms, something is seriously wrong. Okay. All right, doc. So doctors don't know what that panel does. Usually not. All right. So that's why it's written generically. Okay. All right, let's do this. <clears throat> Send for biomed, there's an alarm on the wall. All right, man, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay, all right. Well, Doc, I'm gonna check around the room. I can hear the alarm, okay? So uh, that means that there's an electrical hazard in the room. Watch the cords, okay? We're gonna step around, uh, don't touch anything. We have to check because someplace there's an electrical hazard. Okay, Doc, just keep doing what you're doing. We're going to check around, all right? And the first thing I always do is you start at one wall and you go around. And you have to check because there could be 30, 40, 50 or more electrical outlets in an OR room. Start on one wall, start walking around, and start looking for the hazard. Okay? Now, imagine that this right here is the patient, because this is exactly how it happened. All right, Doc, take this over here, all right? So when I'm walking around the room, I'm checking all the cords and whatnot, and the reason I have a second person with me, especially for these, is because it's electrical hazard. Your life could be in jeopardy too. You have no clue what's going on. It's always best to have somebody there in case you get locked up. I've been locked up twice in my life, that means like you're grabbing on something you can't let go, okay? It's happened twice in my life. That's why I have no rings on or anything because this is a real thing, okay? Oh, okay. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Doc, uh, you've got propofol dripping inside your device. Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, that is what's causing the alarm on the wall. Okay. Well, I'll have a nurse report this later. Thank you. Oh, uh, I, I'm sorry, Doc, but uh, that device is a hazard. It's, it's got to come with me. You need to leave the room now. Doc, this device is coming with me. I won't leave this device. And then what really happened is my Biomed 2 was with me. And then uh, the device was, she literally took the device away from the patient, scooted it two feet back, and she asked me to leave. All right. And then when that happened, I said, that device is coming with me. Propofol was dripping. It's still plugged in. She didn't even unplug it. Like she just scooted it two feet away from the patient's head. And, and I, I've i been around propofol for years. I don't know if it's flammable. Do you? Who knows, right? We have to treat everything as worst case scenario, right? The, you know, there's, there's a combustion level to everything. Okay. Hey man, I need you to go over to anesthesia, go and get them another hotline. Okay. Make sure it's got all the accessories with it and bring it on back. Okay. And be really careful when you come around. Okay. Okay, Doc, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take this device. I'm going to scoot over here in the corner. I'm going to clean up the propofol on the ground. You just worry about the patient, okay? I'll take care of this for you, all right? Okay. Device is unplugged. It's isolated. Setting everything up. Plugging it in. Hey, Doc, your new hotline's here. It's ready to go. We clean up the propofol, it might still be slippery, wash it, okay? And remember, your propofol is now empty because it drained all over the floor, okay? So you might have to order some more, all right? Is there anything else you need, Doc, before I leave? That's it. Okay, Doc. I'm going to take this device. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to have an incident report written up, and uh, I'll take care of this for you, okay? All right. Call me if you need anything else, all right? characters. <laughs> Believe it or not, the doctor was way angrier, and it oh. was a she, oh. and she was know. adamant that I get out of her room. Yeah. <sighs> what would you have done? The biomed one that was with me, actually he was biomed two at the time. He was completely uh, intimidated. Hmm. In your career, sometimes you're going to have line in the sand moments where you're going to, I've martyred my career twice, okay? Which means after you burn a bridge with somebody, you have to move someplace else. And I can tell you those stories. They're, they're crazy, but things changed because I did that for the better. Um, and to this day, you know, the hospitals that, that happened with, they changed their policies and procedures and whatnot, and things are better. But you have to accept the fact that once you go against the political spectrum, all right, because hospitals are very political. You might have to go someplace else because that person could make your life miserable from then on. Could happen. <clears throat> so the patient's unconscious. Everybody else in that room did not care. They just wanted to proceed. It's alarming, like mm, the whole time. Everybody else was ignoring it. They just wanted the alarm to stop. If there was a silence button, they would have hit it and just pressed on. There is no silence button. For good reason. So when she asked me to leave, I did. I sent the Biomed 1 to go and get something. That's why it's so nice to have a Biomed 1 because not only can they see how to, to operate in those tense situations, but to have a second set of hands is invaluable. I was able to clean up the ground because propofol is very slippery. It's, it's actually pretty dangerous because if you don't know, it's the stuff that killed Michael Jackson. That's the stuff that he was injecting and it, it makes you pass out. It's a, it's a sedative. So who knows what it does, especially when it's exposed to heated electronics. It could vaporize like most other anesthetants. Vaporized anesthetant means people get a headache and they pass out like that. You have no clue. Like it just happens. Like you're standing there doing something. I've had leaky anesthesia machines where people pass out. Just you never know. And you know, you smell a funny little odor and then next thing you know, gone. So anyway, she did ask me to leave. Um, 
What goes with a device when it's involved in a patient or safety uh, or staff safety incident? What goes with it? That's eventually what's going to happen for sure. But what goes with it? Notice when I left the room, every single thing that was touching that device went with me. The power cord, the accessories, consumables. If there's consumables that are connected to the patient, pads or something, have them remove them from the patient and bring it with you, okay? And when I'm carrying the device out of the room and down to Biomed to isolate that device, I had my gloves on the whole time. The device is contaminated. It was in a room, it has not been wiped down, shouldn't be wiped down because you don't know if there's fluid intrusion or something. Wait until you get it, you set it off to the side, you notify your supervisor, your biomed manager, say there was an incident, you tell them exactly what happened. If you ever get in an, even a slight argument with a nurse or doctor, tell your supervisor. It could be the stupidest thing. You're like, hey, it's blue. No, it's beige. No, it's blue. It could be the stupidest argument. That doctor will tell this doctor, and then that will go to the OR director or wherever, and it goes right to your biomed director. And it was the stupidest thing, but give them a heads up before it happens. So he can be the political person that says, hey, I heard there was a situation this morning. You know, you can reach out to me at any time. Let him be the politician, not you, okay? You are already a conflicted party. So if there's ever an incident with you and a doc where you had an argument, and trust me, I marched immediately down there with the device, with all the cables, with my Biomed 1. And we told him exactly what happened, gave him a heads up that, hey, if this doc says that there's a problem because I left the room, you know, and I, I wasn't going to leave the room, uh, that kind of situation was really intense. I figured she was going to talk. And for all I know, she did. But I gave my supervisor a heads up exactly what happened. And I filed an incident report. At every hospital, if you work for a hospital, you have the ability to uh, create an incident report, which is basically saying what happened, what was involved, like the device ID and whatnot. You don't give it opinions, like I think it was this person's fault or that person's fault, just the facts. There's propofol dripping inside the device. I assumed control of the device and I brought a replacement unit and cleaned up the propofol that was on the ground. That's really all that you need to put in the report. If they need more details, they'll come to you. Don't burn a bridge, like don't, don't, don't put your opinion in it, okay? Incident reports, you will do them, that's a promise, or you should. All right, and the last scenario. This one here, luckily, uh, I've had a couple times where anesthesia machines have failed during the case, like straight up fail. Uh, I'm talking shut off while they're doing surgery and everybody loses their mind, okay? This is pretty intense. And when you are a junior biomed and you walk into these situations, it's gonna hurt. There's, there, you're not going to win no matter what happens. Just do your best. As a senior biomed, there's certain things that you can do. And maybe it's because I was in the military and they give you kind of that readiness type of mindset. Like, okay, if this happens, I'll do that, you know? And they kind of ingrain that into you. Maybe that's why I can walk into an overarm room and, and do what I'm about to show you. But this is actually what happened, okay? So... This is our patient, and I'm going to get my anesthesia machine, because it was an anesthesia machine that failed. There's something that I call mass stupidity. It's really a mass panic is what it is. And when things go wrong, everybody, including the doctors, can lose their mind. It could be the stupidest thing, like just flick the power switch back on. You know, maybe somebody kicks a cord out. Everybody loses their mind in there. Like, they're panicking. Like, oh, we don't know what to do. You walk in and, like, people are screaming and stuff. Trust me, I've done it. I've seen it. Just remain calm. That's why it's always nice to go in with two people so you have two opinions on what to look for, okay? So that's what we're going to show you. This is the absolute craziest thing that you could happen, okay? So I need an anesthesia doc. Professor, you want to help me out with this one? This one is pretty intense, okay? Yeah. yeah this, so this one here, this is what happens when everything goes wrong. And 
when you have these uh, in the fans uh, situations, it always takes a second biome for you. I mean, you never know what you're walking into. And if anything, it gives you a, a second opinion, like I said, or it could even save your life because I've been electrocuted a couple times. So, Biomid 1, you want to help me out with this? Okay, let's do this. Because this is really, I've seen this a couple times in my career. I, I wish it wasn't so, but it's true. Okay, let's do this. Uh, where are my gloves? I need my gloves. Talk about muscle memory. When I walk into an OR, these are like on the wall near the door every single time. So it's muscle memory. When I go in a room, I'm looking for them. Okay, let's run. All right, send for Biomed. Uh, the NSC machine keeps beeping. Oh, boy. All right, let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. Hey, Doc, what's going on? I can hear the beeping. I don't know. There's some message that says error AC power failure, so I, I don't know what's going on. Oh, my. Okay. All right, Doc. Go ahead and keep doing what you're doing. Let me check out the electrical and let me see what's going on. <laughs> okay, so anesthesia machines usually have about 30 minutes worth of runtime from the time they lose AC power. Okay, so they have batteries in them. They are gonna run for a period of time. If you've been maintaining them correctly, you'll get 30 minutes. If you haven't, you might have five minutes. You don't know. Okay, so that's when this happens. It's the real deal, like it's, it's go time. So the first thing I do when I go in is I check the back of the anesthesia machine I check to make sure it's plugged into a red outlet. And one of the first things that I will do, if both things are plugged in, I will switch outlets, something else, okay? And that outlet, I will plug something else into it and test that device, a light source or whatever. It's powering up. Oh, hell. There is power at the outlet. Oh, oh. plug it back into its outlet. Go back over, check the device. Okay, you see the error code says AC mains power failure. Okay, Doc, here's what's going on. You have about 30 minutes of runtime on this machine. We have to do a swap. There is no option. The device will shut down in about 20 to 30 minutes, okay? So here's what I need you to do. Uh, first off, Bamed, uh, hey, can you run, prep the backup anesthesia machine, make sure all the cabling's on there, make sure that the patient monitor is on the top, make sure it's ready to go, and bring a spare breathing circuit, okay? When you're ready, I want you to pull up to the back door over here and go ahead and stage it outside the room and we will do a swap, okay? So go get an anesthesia tech, have them help you, and go. All right, Doc, so what's gonna happen here? When I shut this machine down, because we have to get it out of the way in order to get the new one in, this machine is going to stop breathing. So where's your Ambu bag? Ambu bag's the large bag that they put over the face and that helps them breathe. Do you have your Ambu bag, Doc? Uh, okay, I see you've got propofol, but it's not spiked. Go ahead and spike your propofol because we're going to switch off your anesthesia here in a moment. This is the next level stuff, guys. The Doc is losing his mind. He is thinking all about the patient. He forgot to spike his propofol, okay? This is stuff, as you get experience, you're, and I am so firm on experience and knowing how the Doc does his job, because when this type of stuff happens, you only have minutes, all right? So it's so necessary for us to know the clinical applications of the device. I know that you can take off the anesthesia machine and you can use the Ambu bag to keep breathing. I've seen it many times throughout my career. And I know the propofol because once the machine shuts off, your anesthesia gas stops. The patient is gonna wake up. That's really bad. They're still operating, okay? That, uh, that would be extremely, extremely bad. So I take a look at the doctor's situation. They have an IV pole standing next to them. They almost always have a propofol bottle up there and it's got a rubber stopper in the end. They spike it and then it's got a, uh, an IV drip line that comes out, okay? So when I look at it and it's not even spiked, it's not even prepared, the sterile set is still sitting there on the IV stand. You notify the doc, hey man, can you go ahead and set that up? Okay. Uh, Go ahead and bring in the, the spare machine. I want you to sit it off over here to the back. Okay, Doc, here's what we're gonna do. On the count of three, I'm gonna shut the machine down. You're gonna swap over the tracheal tube to your Ambu bag, and you're gonna start breathing. We're gonna pull the machine back, okay? Okay, on the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. 
Okay. And as soon as the machine's off, now I can disconnect the gases because if you lose gases while the machine's on, it's going to go nuts. The doctor who's over there, not the anesthesia doc, but the other doc, is going to be like, oh, cod, because he thinks the patient's dying, okay? So to stop those alarms, we shut the machine off before we disconnect the gases, which they screw on. There's like four hoses. It's a pain in the butt. So we scoot the machine back, and then the Biomed 1 brings the other machine up. We connect the gases before we turn the machine on. We check the power, make sure it's in, make sure everything's good, make sure that there's an absorber and stuff like that on there because if it's not, all the air is gonna to go to the room, okay? So we check the machine, make sure everything's good, the power is good, computer's plugged in, okay, let's flick it on. I'm gonna be there with the dock watching it go through the, the power self-check, you know? Every anesthesia machine goes through a checklist and, okay doc, let's, Check it. All right, we got the sterile set connected. Can you swap it over and set your patient limits? You have to set the volume or the pressures for the patient. Okay, and he's gonna shut off the uh, propofol. Okay, I'm not gonna tell him to do any of that. I just help him, you know, remember. And then uh, he's gonna set the patient parameters and he's gonna take over. So when it happens, I'm gonna take a step back. I'm gonna direct you. Can you take that machine and take it outside the room? All the consumables and everything, keep them with it. We're gonna do a patient incident report, okay? All right. I'm gonna stay there for a minute with the doc. This part's pretty important because he just went through hell, right? It's his assurance that I'm here, no matter what you need. It could be the stupidest thing. I'll be the runner and go help him, okay? All right, doc, looks like everything's good. Your patient's doing good. All right, sir. Well, we are going to do an incident report and maybe figure out what happened to that machine. But in the meanwhile, if they have any problems with the device, go ahead and give us a call. I'll come back over as soon as I can. Okay, sir? Okay. All right. Excellent. Thank you, sir. Let me know if you need anything. Good. That scenario actually played out exactly like that. When there's no coordination, if you if you don't coordinate with the anesthesia doc, I have had them disconnect the machine while the patient's still breathing, the anesthesia techs. Because anesthesia techs, they don't think like a biomed, they don't think like a doctor, they think like an anesthesia tech. Well, I'll just swap this device with that device. It's still connected to the patient. So I just take visual cues of the doctor's readiness for what I'm about to do next. I will give them those cues about like, hey, you know, where's this, where's that? Okay, you ready? And always communicate, like we're gonna disconnect this. You ready, sir? Okay, let's do it. And as long as there's communication, even if things go wrong, you're working together as a team, okay? That's all that matters. So anyway, guys. <sighs> do you see why understanding the clinical applications of your medical device can help you? It's absolutely imperative. So many people know the manual, they know how to do a PM on the device. That is that much of the job. Knowing how your, your doctors and nurses relate to the device is everything. It's gonna help you figure out how to prevent damages. It's gonna help you figure out problems when they happen in the field. It could save somebody's life. It really could. And what should be done immediately after they leave the room? What do you think? What's the first thing that we should do as soon as we leave the room? Start the incident report. Start the incident report, absolutely. You take that device, all its cabling, and if you're the person that did the PM on it, you cannot do the incident investigation, okay? You, you do the incident report because you responded. The investigation is usually done by a senior level biomed who's a disinterested party. So somebody that did not PM the device, somebody that had no operations with the records, of that device because you never want to seem like you're culpable, okay? You wanna always be just an unbiased opinion, right? And that's really important because a lot of biomeds don't do incident reports and the ones that do might even do incident reports for their own equipment, which makes no sense at all, okay? Your incident investigation should usually be done by a biomed manager or Phoebe, because now I'm part of Phoebe, 
Now we are going to be doing incident investigations for hospitals. So if they have a problem, they can contract us out. I can come in and, you know, as long as they isolate everything, I'll do my best to figure out what's going on. And then we're going to ship the device maybe out to the manufacturer because I can tell you the functionality if it's doing what it's supposed to, but they're going to take a look at the inside. The manufacturer is going to check every single little thing to see what really happened. Maybe even go into the code of the program, who knows? So as soon as you leave with a device, you isolate everything, you put notes on it along with your work order saying that there's an incident and you don't touch it from there. You wait for your bottom end manager to make a decision. That is it. All right, guys. Well, like I said, I will talk and talk and talk, man. So I apologize for that, but I absolutely love this kind of stuff. Are there any questions that you guys have for me? Because uh, I will just keep on running on. So does Foby have a, a physical location that yes. you guys like repair equipment at or do you yes. all go sent out? We do. Um, so Foby has a main office down by Houston, but they're building another building as we speak. And we have a team up here by Dallas that's running around. So. We have several teams, and by the time I'm done over this next year, we're going to have probably teams all around the United States. So uh, that might seem a little zealous, but I am 120% committed to making my company as big as possible. And I got some really cool stuff that I can't tell you about that's in the works. And uh, it's going to change the way some biomeds do business. That's a promise. Stuff that's never been done before, we are going to be doing it first. And uh, I think April at the uh, conference in Atlanta is when we're going to introduce it. And we'll see how everybody takes it from there. It's about the fact that you will be told what you can and can't do. Your career is up to you. It's not up to anybody else. Your boss, you think he has your career as his best intentions? No. Your boss doesn't. You're, the fact that you might have to switch between companies is almost a certain. You're almost guaranteed you're going to have to do it. Because eventually you're going to keyhole yourself into a position where you're going to be stuck. You're going to be doing anesthesia machines, but you want to do imaging. You're stuck on doing infusion pumps, but you want to get into something more complex. It happens to us all because they have their best interests in mind, not ours. And that's something that you have to be aware of. So job titles, um, your career, it's all completely up to you, man. Your pay. I have had people sit there, I kid you not, the, the same biomed that has got me in trouble a few times. I swear that when I started at this place, I had an office inside an operating room. This dude was sitting on a chair in the back and there was spots in the floor. All right, so I'm in the operating room. That's where my biomed shop is, that's pretty rare. I was on my hands and knees with orange cleaner and a wire brush and I was scrubbing these spots out of the floor because there are stains in, in the laminate. And uh, he's sitting over there in his chair. I'm the team leader, mind you. He's sitting over in the chair and he's lamenting about how that hospital doesn't pay very well. I'm paid a wee bit more than he is, but I'm on my hands and knees scrubbing the floor. It's one of those perfect situations. Those floors have been there for years. Why didn't they get clean before that? There is tape over the window of the door for the biomed shop because nobody wanted anybody looking in. I had an open door policy. I want that door left open all the time. Doctors, nurses, if they want to stop by and have a chat, I'd rather them chat with me before they chat to the director. Let's, let's get these things nipped in the bud before they become big problems. And because of that, we actually had fires in the operating room and whatnot. That was resolved because people just stopped by and be like, hey, you know, I don't think something's right over in this room. You mind go checking it out? I had doctors that would come in and they'd pull up a chair just to chat, you know? I've had some of the coolest conversations with these guys just because they felt that open door policy and everything was presentable, you know? That's the other key is like clean up your work environment. You never know who's gonna stop by. So um, it's been quite the journey, guys. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to share a few things with y'all that you're not gonna learn unless you're in the field. And the chance of you making a mistake, one of these mistakes is pretty good because people do all the time. And I'm just trying to make you guys better before you even get out there, man. So if there's nothing else you got for me, I 
would love to see your lab and see what's going on. Yeah.